You're listening to Development Works, produced by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Hello, friends. I'm Andrew Wilson. And I'm Michael Carlson. This is Development Works, supported by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. And on today's upcast, before doing international development, no, wait, Mike, we need to do international development right now. We need to do it right here. Let's go. We hear from Gabby from the Student Club at the University of Toronto to let us know more about our speaker, Paul Hamill. Paul Hamill is a professor at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Toronto. Although his research focuses on molecular biology, he has a passion for global health, so much so that he also teaches global health and human rights and international health. Today on the Upcast, Paul lets us know what works in international development. But first, this Upcast is powered by Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. We're a Canadian charity that sponsors the medical education of high-potential youth in rural Nicaragua. If you want to ensure everyone has access to quality health care, first, visit doctorsfordoctors.ca. What is less well discussed, but is certainly well known, and the poor students in my class have to hear this over and over and over and over and over and over, um, is that the, the notion of Poverty and inequality are the two predictors of health outcomes on a global scale. It's not how many doctors you have, it's not how many nurses you have, but it's the consequences of poverty and inequality that generate the conditions in which all of this stuff works. So let me just go through, you know, I'm just going to talk briefly about a, a little bit of data and then suggest to you how we, can, how we might get around those problems. So um, in 2008, the World Health Organization finally put out a, a publication dealing with uh, called the uh, Report on the Social Determinants of Health. Um, and one of the conclusions they wrote, in which um, you know, my poor students have to hear all the time, is most of the high burden of illness leading to appalling premature loss of life arises of the immediate and structural conditions in which people are born, work, live, uh, live work, and age. That is, the context or the structure of the society in which people live are the direct determinants of how people will live and die, whether that is under five, whether during their work they will die because of, of, of injuries or because of uh, a variety of other reasons, whether they die prematurely for a whole variety of reasons. So let's think about the first Millennium Development Goal, which is, which is you know, directly proportional to this idea of, of health outcomes. Um, it, the first target was to have between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of people whose income is less than $1.25 a day. Now, very few people have thought about what that means. What, what does $1.25 a day mean? That, that's called extreme poverty. Um, and then the second, well, the, the, the question that comes with it is who decided $1.25? Initially, it was $1 a day. So this number comes from somebody at the World Bank. Um, who is responsible, who are responsible for a number of the uh, things that have caused people in Africa to live a certain way. So we won't have time to talk about those. But if you consider this, this number, $1.25 a day, um, it's now been sort of projected to uh, $1.90 a day, and that's extreme poverty. And then above that is this new line called $3.10 a day, which is sort of this uh, poverty level um, that is not extreme poverty, but it's still poverty. And we're trying to get people up to a poverty, poverty level. So the, dollar, uh, the $3.10 a day works out to about $122 per month for someone living in Toronto. That's what that number means. So I don't know about you, but $122 a month in this city is not possible. Uh, if you look at the United States, the poverty level, I wrote this down just a second ago, the poverty level uh, for a family of four in the United States is... Um, $63 a day, which works out to about $16 a day per person. To give you an idea of the breadth and scope of that level, if you take off the top 24 countries in the world that are rich countries in the world, and you just mush together all the rest of the countries who are below the, that level, of those people, uh, you find that below this number of um, $10 a day, for example, it's almost 80% of the population lives below $10 a day of the entire planet. If you go to the poverty line of the United States and $16, it works out to about 90% of everyone on the planet, with the exception of these rich countries, live in poverty. So this is, it's, it's almost mind-boggling to, to understand or believe uh, or to think about how massive this problem is. 
And we have to juxtapose that to another curious phenomenon, which is on the planet Earth, we're now living at a time when there's more wealth than at any other time in human history. Um, you know, one of the gazillion estimates, this one comes from the, um, the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Data Book in 2014. The total wealth on the planet is expected to be somewhere, is, is, is higher than $250 trillion. The amount of money it would take to get everybody below the extreme poverty line up to that extreme poverty line would work out to 0.03% of the GDP of the planet. So the amount of money it takes to get people up to these different to these levels is actually really quite remarkably small, like infinitesimal. It would be you wouldn't even notice it in a bank account. And the number of people that it would change their lives is is on the order of billions. And yet, in our system, we currently do not have any will to do those sorts of things. This dollar twenty-five a day, when you project it now with um, to uh, to where we are in the year 2000, this is 2016, um, the people at the World Bank have, have admitted that $1.25 a day would be equivalent to 37 people living on a single minimum wage with no benefits in, in the UK. So the, these are the kind of numbers that are batted around all the time. When we think about global health, we want to get people out of this extreme poverty. Um, and, and the numbers actually tell you that it's, there's almost... Uh, it, it's trivial to actually change the conditions of people on a global scale, but we don't do that. Rather, we do a bunch of other activities which we call development, which are supposed to be helping people on, on these, uh, uh, in this uh, way. To give you a further example of um, the way that the world is reorganized, Oxfam last year um, came out with their new report in which they track how much income of the top people it takes to equal the bottom 50% of humanity. And if you remember that report, they named eight people, uh, seven of them in the United States and then and one in, uh, in Mexico. Those eight people had the same income in the year 2015 as 3.5 billion other people. So this is, this is the nature of the way we have organized the planet. We've, we've created a system in which most of the people live in poverty, and the consequences of that are the direct material deprivation of people in poverty give rise to all these uh, problems that we quantify over and over, being a professor at the University of Toronto, and people in public health, we get to quantify that stuff and get our job and our promotion, but we actually don't do anything about it. Things are getting much worse with respect to the levels of poverty and the levels of inequality on a global scale. The direct consequence is more and more ill health. So I want to suggest that maybe we're aiming in, in, the, wrong, uh, in the wrong way. So Mike, we're definitely zooming way out here. This is probably our first speaker to look at this from such a large scale point of view. Yeah. And he says that the main cause for really all international development is just global poverty. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to boil it down to a thing about economics, a thing about money, right? So this, this is a first. So let's actually go into this because there was some incredible numbers that Paul was talking about there. So this idea that $1.25 a day is this extreme poverty measure. Now, then he also goes on to say, well, there's this new line, right, at $1.90 a day. Um, and then there's this arbitrary line at $3.10 a day, which is no longer extreme poverty. So this this whole thing to me is fascinating because all these numbers really just go back to, and Paul says this, like who, who decides all this stuff? It, it's what means, uh, what does it mean to have a dollar 25 and then who decided it to possibly jump that to 190? Like, um, what level of suffering do you have to go through in order to make the extreme poverty line or not? I think, so Paul's talk started to remind me of a book I read a while ago called The End of Poverty by Jeffrey Sachs. And uh, Jeffrey Sachs's book was way more optimistic than Paul's talk um, because I think he was trying to end it on like a let's go save the world note. Um, and Paul, I mean, he, start, he starts talking about many other really interesting things later on. So we'll get to listen into that. But in his book, he defines extreme poverty as really not being able to 
it's the it's the dollar amount that you have that you just it's impossible to afford the basic services of life. We're talking about access to clean water. We're talking about basic nutrition, uh, education, and probably some shelter in there as well. Right. And that that like under a dollar a day was what was considered just impossible in any country to be able to afford that. And then I think that got increased because inflation and you know other countries and blah blah blah. And but who decided? that staying alive was this bare minimum, right? Why is there no understanding of suffering or something like that, right? Like, it's almost like in the healthcare system. Like, we we have this mindset of, like, keep people alive, but there's no focus on happiness or, like, fulfillment or um, the ability to stay connected to family. Like, clearly these numbers are super made from like a Western perspective, which is like, how, how do you not die? Or like, what is this bare level of suffering? But like, it's not like these people are going to be alleviated from suffering at this rate. And I guess that's, that's what I'm really trying to hit on here, that there's a value set that decided this and is now imposing this idea of poverty on a huge group. So the other number in there is like the U S family of four making 63 bucks a day, right? That's, that's the poverty line. Yeah. So somebody in the U.S. made a similar take based on inflation of goods and services in the U.S. And so obviously all these numbers are relative depending on your space and country. But I just think the whole grounding on this is a value set that is now being imposed. And maybe actually what we're doing by talking about this kind of poverty is furthering these ideas of colonization, furthering these ideas of uh, these things that we want to avoid in international development, which is telling people how they want to live. You are in poverty because you make less than this. Did you decide that? And who, who around you in your community decides what poverty looks like? So, I, I mean, I definitely understand where you're coming, right? There is one side where it's, I, I see the argument of don't, don't label someone as being poor just because they're making less than that. And I think that's kind of like the, the social uh, like argument of that, but this number was decided by the United Nations, right? Like it was a number that was decided on by hopefully groups of non-biased people that just, you know, it's hard to say, you know, if you can't afford basic food and shelter for yourself and sure. basic water, like that you're not suffering. Sure. I, I just, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, especially as like a Buddhist, like, I, you know, like let's get beyond suffering is the whole point. Right. But I also think that there are like, also, I mean, just as a carpenter, there are basic physical needs you have to be, you have to meet right. in order to have a body that functions enough to not suffer. There's a base, there's a baseline here. And I guess Paul does a good job of just reflecting like, Hey, what's this all about? And I think yeah. running with it starts starts to beget some good conversations. So the second yeah. piece, the second piece of this, if I can move on here, is um, these other numbers that are basically like, what would it take to figure all this out? So like eighty percent of the population living below ten dollars a day, right, of the entire planet. And if if we took zero point zero three percent of all of the wealth of the world, we could get everyone out of extreme poverty. So I just did a rough like back of the envelope calculation here. And so like I make, let's say I make 60 grand a year, right? If I give away $18 of that, so 60 grand and $18, that's 0.03%. If everybody did a similar calculation, we should be able to get rid of extreme poverty. That to me is insane. Yeah, this number always blows my mind. And in Paul's talk, he mentioned that, you know, you wouldn't even notice it if it just came out of your bank account, you know? And that to me is almost laughable, the idea that how have we not done this yet? This is so yeah. upsetting. Yeah. It's crazy. Like, I I don't know, this this kind of like tax thing wouldn't fly probably, but I, I wonder if it could. I wonder if just part of your taxes could be, and here's the 0.03% tax to just equalize the world. That's just that's just what this is doing. And then this is the fund that the entire we live up in Canada that the entire Canadian government has to go like give away and try to eradicate poverty. Could you imagine if we lived in a world where every government agreed and upheld that standard? That would be the craziest thing, I think, to fly. I've never heard of anything like that on such a global scale. That would be impressive. I think there are a bunch of countries who don't even just tax their citizens. 
Um, so that that would not <laughs> that would not fly in those places. Uh, that would be. It's a tough. It's it sounds easy on paper. I think it's way more complicated logistically speaking. But I, like, let's you know the the overall goal is. Uh, the overall point here is that let's just keep moving and working towards, you know, sp- getting our money, getting our resources over to many billions of people that need it more than us. I think yep. like, and it's not that crazy. Yep. So uh, let's move on here. In this next clip, Paul talks about the most important issues of our time and how that will affect global development as well. So Mike, let's listen in. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention too, uh, and I mentioned, I sort of brought it up before, this idea of trying to change the world so that people on a global scale don't live in, in, in the conditions in which ill health uh, exists and, and is propagated. Um, this paper by David Woodward also pointed out a really interesting paradox or problem that we have now have to face. The idea that we're going to increase the lot of people around the world so that sort of like us, this notion of development has now run up against this problem of climate change. Development implies that we're going to be using massive levels of, of resources on a planet that is finite. And we know already from these reports that we have a very, very short period of time in which to get our act together and actually start reducing the amount of human activity, the amount of stuff we pump into the air, the amount of stuff we use on the Earth's crust. And yet, the essence of global health or development is to actually increase it. We want to make sure everyone has more and more and more. Well, these are not compatible concepts. They're actually impossible to fulfill in one regard because we will reach a limit where we can no longer sustain uh, you know, the planet and, the, and its ecosystems if we want to promote development in the way that we think about development. There's lots of stuff out there which will describe, you know, maybe what we need is a, a notion known as degrowth. Maybe we have to go backwards, which is not the same thing as de-development, but maybe we need to think about the way we measure things has to be changed in a way that allows us to subtract so that, you know, when we knock forests down or we start polluting the air, that's taken into account when we're trying to do, say, the GDP of a country, which we currently don't do. Um, so I want to sort of leave you with, with this strange conundrum in that, you know, we, we, we very often think about these things as a moral responsibility. It's, it's fair that everyone in the world is treated well and they have access to all the things we, we have. But we've now run up against another dilemma that we've created, which prevents us from actually trying to fulfill that, not just because of the social economic structure that exists, but also because the limits of our environment prevent us from doing those things. So how we're going to sort that out is a really difficult question that we're going to have to think about and continue um, trying to sort out, and, and one that's virtually intractable as far as I can see right now. Because d- development is, we, we tend to distill, and I'm guilty of it as well, we tend to distill all these things down to social econ- or, sorry, economic factors. Development means factories, it means more roads, it means you know, plumbing and water and all the rest of the stuff. But development is, is a, a more holistic idea. It's about how communities can thrive. And it doesn't, they don't always need to have more and more and more stuff. So if we think about it only in terms of, you know, they have more of these things that we have, then I think we miss the point that people can, can have, leave incredibly rich lives without just having more and more stuff. In fact, we're, we're very much um, inundated. I don't want to say brainwashed because everyone here is very, very smart, so I'm sure you're not. Uh, but inundated with with the idea that more stuff equals development, more stuff is good. And we might consider the possibility that more stuff is actually antithetical to existence and change the way we understand that. The problem is then you run up against the, 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 the central problem, which is capitalism, and its structures prevent us from thinking a different way and also right now prevent us from addressing the very core problems that we need to address. We can reorganize the way we, we, we do things. But that that's, requires a revolution of ideas. Uh, whether that requires revolution, that's another problem, right? That, and it's, it's not very often that radical changes have occurred where there hasn't been a kind of a revolution. What the IPCC has basically said is that that's what's needed. If you read between the lines, it's not we're going to all hold hands and sing kumbaya and sort of hope that maybe a few people will get their act together. We have to actually 
if we're serious about it, we have to think about taking to the streets and stopping what is the inevitable you know, destruction of this planet. So if we're going to develop, if all these things are going to go on, we need to share them on a global scale. Well, you know, what's curious is the, is the great contradiction in the system that exists. We want, every, you know, the people, the masters of the universe want you to think about things on a global scale. You know, we're all globalized now and, and we're all talking to people across borders. And, but what they don't want is people to, to actually start distributing things on a global scale fairly. What they want is they still want these countries to be poor and they want to extract labor and all these other things. So we, we do need development, but what we need is on a global scale, you know, tone that down or, or stop it and change the way that we live. Now that's, that's where the, the, the problem lay, is, is the people who you know, are in an elite position to continue living their lives the way that they always have and, and don't see that sort of future are preventing us from doing that. And we have to wake up to, to doing this. You know, but a, and, and a basic fundamental problem of that is in this institution. We basically don't teach people to do this in this place. We don't have this conversation in there. You know, we're in you know, the School of Management, in the Faculty of Medicine. We're not teaching everybody that we have to actually stop doing what we're doing. We're putting these things in place so we can make more money and more development. So, um, you know, this is one of the places that, that is also letting us down. So, Mike, I'm voting Paul for Prime Minister. Yep, me too. And where, also, do I, where do I sign Mike, up? Can I just ask, was this podcast recorded in a plane? I'm pretty <laughs> sure I heard a plane in the background. This is where Andrew's love of audio quality comes in. It's the reason why uh, the podcast sounds so clean and crisp and sharp. Uh, so, but it's also, you know, you can't, you can't stop can't stop an audio engineer slash chiropractor from commenting on background noise. Is it just me who doesn't want planes flying in the backgrounds of their recordings? I don't know. I don't you know, know what? We should put out a survey all, here. All the list, yeah, all the listeners out there, please send us an email. <laughs> let us know if uh, if you heard planes and if you want the planes to stop in the background. There is nothing more important going on in this podcast than that. Nothing. Right there. That is the survey. That's that we sad. will start. So, Mike, let's actually talk about a thing. Yeah, let's do it. So, <laughs> I wanted actually to start off to walk us through a really important contradiction here, and it's this mm -hmm. idea of global health versus climate change. Fascinating. And I I had never really thought about this before, but it kind of makes sense to me. So, what Paul was saying was, uh, if 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 international development happened overnight, right? Like, let's say all of our resources yeah. are distributed. Uh, sure. Everybody in you know the poor like 3.5 billion people in the world. Let's say they all like had their own car and you know had access to all of the things we had access to. Mm -hmm. um, that would be horrible for the climate, uh, and obviously almost overnight we would probably see climate change happen pretty quickly. And then sure. again, like storms would happen. Uh, you know the the world would would probably turn in that in that kind of you know the way that we're all kind of afraid of happening where ocean sea levels would rise, storms would increase all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. again, that would increase the need for global health. Sure. And yeah, that by increasing health metrics through, through these sort of traditional means, build, a, build a hospital, right. To increase health. Then you've got all these fossil fuels that are feeding into climate change, which is then impacting health. Uh, and so it's like a catch 22. Yeah. I do think though, and I like I agree for sure in principle worldwide at a larger scale, um, governments for example see development in in this one way right like they see roads they see bridges they see um, city infrastructure look at the work that China's doing all over the world to build that stuff right yeah. that takes fossil fuels for sure but there are organizations I would like to say ours as well at Doctors for Doctors where we're finding the space in between, right? We're finding the, uh, the things that aren't tangible stuff, but are that like intellectual capital. So we are training doctors, which, you know, maybe in like secondary tertiary impacts increases fossil fuels, but ultimately doesn't have that and increasing capacity and development of people uh, intellectually and professionally is... Uh, not really on the table here and is a, is a good way, I think, around that. Um, teaching people how to do things um, is going to 
uh, I think, have an impact on health without furthering all the climate change stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, the work that we're doing in Nicaragua shows that I think there's lots of examples of, uh, yeah, just this broad, we can do work in different ways. And I'd be curious to know of other organizations that are doing similar work. Like, okay, let's, a theoretical example, every Canadian university opens up space to um, people that live in different countries for professional programs. You know, the amount that we would spend on building that intellectual capital, very minimal. But the impact or the potential impact of empowering these people with that knowledge in their own countries is going to be huge. Then you have the brain drain piece and they want to stick around here and actually make more money and not go back. But yeah. so. So, I mean, and this happened in Nicaragua too, right? Um, we, we've talked before about the literacy brigades that went around and kind of developed the rural populations in Nicaragua. There's right. also, I guess, you know, you're right. Like international development doesn't have to uh, increase fossil fuel consumption and, and contribute to climate change. Even things mm-hmm. like just purifying water, right? Sure. And sure. having access to safe and sanitary water or growing vegetables, like those are all things that are just going to help people live in a, a less impoverished world. They don't yeah. necessarily have to contribute to climate change. And the, the more that I'm thinking about it too, there again, Paul is talking about this particular Western paradigm, but I think there are places and people and groups that are doing it differently. Like Cuba's development, right? Cuba it was shut off from the world because of the crazy trade embargo stuff. And then it turns inward to its own people and it gives free education and it develops in a different way. And you see the power of that moving forward, you know, barring the terrible stuff of, you know, regimes there. But that that is a different model for development and it exists out there. And I think we can't discount the people that are trying to set that tone in a different way. I like it. Um, I, I really like what you're saying. And I want to just shift pace here to Paul's other kind of main point that I found, which was capitalism, right? Um, mm. you have, you have <laughs> capitalism, the, right? Am I, am I right? Am I right people? No, it's the, it's that 0.1% that he was talking about. That is, it is destined that inequality will increase in our current model globally, essentially, because sure. as, uh, you know, as trade happens, as buying things happens, uh, we are driven by profit models, which essentially means that the the people at the very top of the pyramid here will constantly get richer and the people mm-hmm. at the bottom will constantly get poorer. And that's just how capitalism has to run because it's driven on a for-profit model. Yeah, and this this idea of making more and of, and, and of increasing your share of the pie. So while the pie is getting bigger, you have people in power we're fighting for a bigger share of that pie. And there's nothing, there's, there's no stops on that. There's no limit on that at all. Um, and I, I like thinking about this, let's say, trade deals like NAFTA in Canada, America, and Mexico that, uh, you know, is focused on this globalization idea, right? We're all talking about, about this with each other. But there's no conversation about the distribution of resources, Right. Trade agreements are almost like, how will our people benefit? But is it, does that actually go down to that lowest level worker, the person who's on the front line in the manufacturing job or in the farm or doing the public service or whatever? Or is it benefiting the the companies and the representatives and the aggregates that can actually talk at that high level? Like if I wanted to start a business, just me personally as Mike, and work and do trade with America, the number of forms and like foreign tax policies and like health things that I would need to know about mean that I need to have such a high level of education and, and the ability to opt into that. It's, it's crazy. The, uh, the barrier there for me accessing this. So it's not about me and I'm pretty well educated. It's not about everyone else. It's about these like bigger conglomerate companies accessing these markets. And I liked what Paul said. It's more about like extracting wealth than distributing wealth. And I really appreciated that. Yeah. Often, I guess when we look at the idea of trade agreements with different countries, we don't take into account that those trade agreements are really only made with the people at the very tops of the pyramid. 
Mm-hmm. And how is that going to get redistributed down the rest of the 99%? Eh, probably not, given what we see. Well, like, in, indirectly, the companies then make jobs, which there's, a, there's an, an argument for, but, like, no one's talking about, like, how do we get these agreements to actually connect with local people? That would be fascinating. Yeah, or elevate, you know, the status of a whole country or something. Like, I haven't seen any, any miracle trade agreement or anything sure. like that. Sure, P- people to try to get on a future podcast. So we went from global health versus climate change there to the idea of starting a revolution. So mm-hmm. that sounds like a normal podcast to me. I'm, I'm in. That's just another Tuesday podcast. We're going to get shut down. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be on some sort of secret Gestapo list somewhere. <laughs> Hopefully not in Canada because our RCMP is really nice. Hopefully. In this next clip... Paul talks about how uh, we can start making changes right now. Uh, and this kind of dialogue is obviously really important for this, this time and place. So let's listen. We go out and we socialize all the time. You, you go to parties and you have dinners and all the rest of the stuff. And you know, like, my, you know, like my place, we weren't allowed to talk about sex, religion, or politics at the table. Right. But if you go to parties, what do we do? We talk about these idiotic things. We talk about boys and girls, or girls and boys, and boys and girls, or you know, cars, things, and all the rest of the stuff. But what if every time you went, that you made sure that you were going to talk about something really serious and important, your, your scale of the, the problems on the planet? You learned today, blah, 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 blah. And you, you generated this conversation. I know we're not supposed to be talking about that stuff on Halloween. We're all dressed in you know, crazy stuff, right? But so what will happen typically, and I, I get this all the time, is that they slowly sort of they say they nod nicely, and you end up in the corner, and you're standing in the cat box, and they're drinking your hand by yourself, right? So, but if we're all in the cat box, <laughs> right, then that means that we're now a group of people that can have this discussion or conversation about precisely this. And we're not dependent on the newspaper to tell us or some you know wretched professor to tell us this stuff. That you can start formulating your own understanding of the way the world's organized and how you're going to deal with it. So it means that we have to kind of change our social environment to start including serious discussions on a full-time basis of politics, of economics, of the social constructs that bind us to these, you know, to, to the, way, the way we think. Um, you know, it's really hard to think about the number of ways that our brains are influenced by things around us. And these, you know, when you get out of the university away from you know, professors prattling on, uh, then you can start thinking for yourself, well, actually, that doesn't make sense, or you come up with your own sorts of ideas. But you've got to exercise that ability to do that sort of thing. We tend not to do that. We tend to spend all our time doing these crazy things uh, or things that, that don't lead us to contemplating what needs to be done. Um, and we certainly stay isolated, which is also... You know, that's a different critique, but, you know, part of the purpose of having you stay at home and watch a lecture on a computer or having you on your cell phone is to isolate you so that you can't get together and do stuff. There's only one, there's only always been one answer, which is to get together with other like-minded people and try to change it as a group of people. I mean, you know, in the end, the people win if they get their act together because they're, they're more forceful and powerful than anybody. I talk about this with the students at this university all the time. Why are you paying tuition? Why do you want to pay tuition? The university depends on you to pay tuition. So if you decide not to, then they're beholden to your requests. All it takes is 30,000 of you to just go, we're not paying. And immediately the professors wouldn't get paid and they would probably be upset. You can, you, you can control and hold in your hands the control of the university if you refuse to pay. You know, look at governing council. They put gov- people on governing council because it used to be the province was the major uh, funder of the place. They're not. You guys are. So run the place. And every time we, I do that in the classes, they go, uh, well, if we, get pay- if we don't get paid, we'll get in trouble. That's why you're here, is to get in trouble. And it's the only time in your life, you know, I don't want to start a revolution in the class, but <laughs> it's the only time in your life when you have absolute freedom to say and do what you want within the boundaries of things, you know, you know They'll be upset with violence and all the rest of the stuff. But you have remarkable freedom here, and you should use that to explore all these possibilities of how to take power from the people who traditionally have power and have turned the planet into this kind of system. 
It's up to you to do it. I'm old. I'm going away. I'm out of the picture. I've left you with a few problems. Nuclear weapons. Don't forget those guys. And, and climate change. As almost two utterly intractable problems. And you're going to have to decide as a group whether you're okay with that. And if you're not, how are you going to change that is, is, is up to you. But you can't do it in the privacy of your own bedroom on a cell phone. You need to be out there with other people to, to do that in your classrooms. You know, who's ever, and now I'm going to talk about in my class, but who's demanded in a classroom that you want to cover a certain subject that's different from what the professor wants? Why not? That would change entirely the way we do our work here. So, Paul, uh, what I got from that clip is Paul has clearly been excluded at parties before. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry. Is that what happened? Because all I could actually hear was another plane in the background. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Was this done audio, in an airport? Audio engineering. So I would also like to, uh, on behalf of Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses, extend uh, a lifelong invite to Paul. Uh, if he's listening out there, hopefully he does listen to this. <laughs> it'd, be f- it'd be funny if he didn't. Also, if one of his <laughs> students could let him know that he gets this invite um, to our parties. And Paul, you are never going to be relegated at one of our parties to standing in the corner if you want to start a revolution. No. No. Uh, you are going to be front and center and we're going to treat you, you know, like just like everyone else who's also started trying to start a revolution at any one of our parties. Yeah, and, everyone's trying uh, to start their own revolution. It's very chaotic. Oh, it's just everybody, everybody acting in isolation, uh, which is unfortunate. No, um, we uh, we do have a party coming up, the November sixteenth fundraiser, and we hope to see Paul there. Uh, and uh, it's called Party with a Purpose, but maybe uh, it should be Party for a Revolution. Um, I like the way you just slipped an advertisement in there, Mike. Um, one one thing yeah. I found in this clip was that I, I just thought Paul really wanted to work himself out of a job. You know, as a U of T <laughs> professor, I give him credit. Um, I feel the same way as a healthcare professional. You want to work yourself out of the job, and I can relate to that. Yeah, no one ever pay tuition again. I also so appreciate the image of Paul saying that and then just like a tumbleweed like blowing by him in front as <laughs> as all as the room full of students are like so terrified to even move. Yeah, is this um, a test? Or like yeah. am I going to get kicked out of your class <laughs> if I stand up and start yelling right now? Yeah, it's a catch 22. If I don't say anything, I fail your class, but if I say something, I get kicked out of the school. Yeah. What hmm. What do I do here? Um, it's tricky. All those, all those pre-meds. Don't know how you deal with them, Paul. Uh, on, uh, a, on a real note, so the yeah. reason I, I actually chose this clip was because it sounds very simple, but I think we, we forget about it. And as, especially in our culture, in our internet culture, in our podcast culture, we don't necessarily have a lot of in-person two-way conversations as much as we sure. should anymore. And we don't get together in groups of people. And I think sure. what I, what I really appreciated this was Paul bringing it back to the foundation of like humanity, which is just get together and be people in large numbers and you can yeah. achieve basically anything. And that, that make change yeah. piece, like how, how to make change is getting together and demanding that. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's also unfortunate that all these institutions are just kind of craving these or creating these kinds of minds that do fall in line, right? Yeah. The people that do homework that say like, yes, I will do this thing, have learned their entire lives to, to do the things that they're told. Yeah. Uh, and that maybe is the grand irony of, uh, of these institutions. Yeah. So also nuclear weapons, right? Uh, Paul was saying that and uh, I agree. Those are a thing that we need to worry about. <laughs> okay. I, I had forgotten about them until he mentioned it, and I was like, oh, damn it. Yeah, that's, that's a different type of development that we don't want to do. I think no. that's, that's an international development that we don't want to have happen, is a future, nuclear arms race. Future, future podcast, How to Survive the Nuclear Apocalypse. Yeah, with Paul. Um, yeah. So I don't know about you, but Mike, I'm definitely ready, more prepared now than ever to be the weirdo at that party trying to have yeah. conversations about revolutions. And to, to survive a nuclear apocalypse. And so to everyone, 
who came out to our event. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you to our speaker, Paul. Thank you to so much, so many people. Uh, we love hosting this event. Uh, and it's for our own personal growth as much as it is the folks in the audience and the folks and the listeners at home. So we do do it every month. Again, to lay down a pitch, uh, we've got one coming up next month. Uh, check out websites and uh, social media to figure out when and where. And uh, hopefully we can keep it in a, in a room that's easy to access this time. Yep. Go to those websites, people. Uh, Paul, I just wanted to say I thought your talk was absolutely incredible. You, you clearly marched to the beat of a very important drum. And thank you. I think those are war war drums. Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for for coming out. Um, we also have Gabby to thank you as well. Uh, she's the president of our University of Toronto Student Club in a segment we call Gabby's Two Cents. On behalf of the University of Toronto Student Club, I would like to thank Paul for inspiring us with his amazing talk. It really motivated us to take action right here and right now, and it taught us a very important lesson, which is that sometimes we have to go against norms or break rules to achieve good things. Thanks again, Paul. For all our listeners, if you want to hear everything that Paul Hamill or any of our other speakers for Development Works say unedited, you can always come to our live recordings at the University of Toronto downtown campus. Check out our website, doctorsfordoctors.ca, to find all the event details. Our Canadian charity strives to do the best international development work possible, and as we continue to learn, we are sharing all our learnings with you. That's right, you. And we would love to hear from you too, so drop us a line on our website if you want to volunteer or get involved. And now, updates for the month. In Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses this month, one of our medical students, Kimberly, is engaging in a medical research program with the University of Toronto students. The goal here is to see what Kimberly wants to research to further her knowledge and career, and then for our students at the University of Toronto to do whatever they can to make that happen and support her in that. If this research lines up with what we want to do with DFD and NFN, we'll actually publish it through a charity and use it for future knowledge and hopefully everybody else's. So uh, then everyone will be able to help people in rural Nicaragua a little bit more. So I'm very excited to say that the conversations have started to take place with Kimberly and that we're well on our way here. Very exciting. On our Canadian side, uh, we are going to party with a purpose on Friday, November 16th, and there will be door prizes, live music, and dancing later on. So anybody who wants to join us down at Grossman's Tavern, downtown Toronto, is more than welcome. $10 at the door, and I believe 15 uh, no, I'm sorry, $10 in advance and $15 at the door. I should know the own prices for the party. Uh, and uh, a few days before that is our monthly development works. Uh, the last one was super successful, as you hear from Paul. Uh, and we've got our incredible student club at U of T who is going to be hosting that again. Well, that does it for this month's update on Doctors for Doctors and Nurses for Nurses. Let's hand it back to Paul for the last word. If we're going to engage in global health, it's fine to be helping people with doctors and nurses and vaccines and those things. And I'm not saying that those are not important. Making sure that kids survive relatively easily treatable diseases is certainly worthwhile and a morally reasonable thing to do. But we will always be doing that forever, as long as, as human species hangs up, uh, is around, um, because we're not changing the conditions which give rise to those. So what I want to argue is, is that when we think about global health, it's fine to go away and do, do that work, but it's probably far more important that we think about how we will interact with the systems that generate those inequalities and ultimately these health outcomes on a global scale while we're here. If we're serious about being global health practitioners, our job actually is here. And that's everything for this month's episode of Development Works. Remember to subscribe to the podcast to stay current with international development. Thanks for listening. This is Andrew and Mike signing off, and remember, if you don't make mistakes, you're not working on hard enough problems.